Today we're going to talk about what the book calls a conventional gas furnace. Everybody else just calls it an old standing pilot. They made standing pilot furnaces up until about 1991 or 1992 when regulations changed and they changed all that efficiency. This particular model is about a 19 or it is a 1980 model gas furnace. This system here is 60% AFUE, annual fuel utilization efficiency. What that means is 60% of the natural gas that I buy goes to heat the house. The other 40% goes out this flue pipe that's completely wasted. We have two holes here. This is the combustion air. This is where the oxygen or the air from the closet area is going to come in to burn. This hole is what we call delusion air. This is the excess air that's going to be coming in and this is going to help slow down the draft from the flue pipe. Uh, also, if there's a back draft or a wind coming through, it can cause this flue gas to come back in this closet. So you're talking about carbon monoxide, anything like that, can draft back in through here. So these are some issues that we have with these old gas furnaces, one of the many reasons that we don't use them anymore. Now this furnace would be installed in a closet and the air from the house would be completely separate. In other words, the bottom of this furnace would be installed in some kind of a box that's connected to the house and then your supply air goes back into the house. Sometimes they're installed in a basement to where you'd have a hole on the side here to where it's pulling return air into the system and then blows the supply air back to the house. Either way, what I want to make clear is the combustion air needed for this, this to burn is completely separate from the air of the house. So what we're going to do next is take these panels off so we can see what's happening underneath. As I take this first panel off, it gives us access to the burners, the air chambers, combination gas valve, electrical controls, and such. The next door down is going to be for our blower control. And this door is usually tight because it don't, you don't want air from the combustion chamber to mix. So this is a solid seal door. Also notice this has a door interlock or a door safety switch. The idea is once you take this door off, it shuts the power off to the entire system. That way you're not running the blower, pulling combustion gas, or even worse, pulling carbon monoxide back into the house and poisoning the family. This door interlock ideally won't be able to come on if you put the wrong door on. The idea of these holes lining up when they try to put the wrong door on, it won't allow that switch to press, so it keeps the system off. And these old gas furnaces, the filter was a lot of times behind this panel. They had this little wire piece that held the filter in. And the filter never set in there very well, so even if you used a good filter, a lot of the air would go around it. The big issue is customers would have to take these doors off, both of these doors off, to access the filter. So every time they're taking doors off, there's more of a risk of did this door seal? Are they pulling combustible gases in? All of these are going to be issues. But this is the idea of the blower. We're pulling air from the house. We heat the air. We blow the air back into the house. Separately, we have the combustion air, the gas. We burn that, and then we exhaust that gas separately outside the house to the flue pipe. So what I'm going to do is turn this around so you can see the side view. I've cut some holes in here to help make this demonstration look a little bit better. So here you can see where all of our combustion side is. Here we have our heat exchanger. This heat exchanger is completely sealed. Well, not this one, we've cut a bunch of holes in it, but the heat exchanger should be completely sealed. So everything on the combustion side burns inside of these chambers. If I turn it to the back side, maybe you can see a little better. Here we can see that these two chambers, the fire is burning inside of here and inside of here. The air from the house is burning on the outside. So we call it a heat exchanger because it's exchanging the heat from the flames and also the gases and also keeping it separate from the air in the house. So this is our heat exchanger. Now what I want to do is I've cut this panel and I'm going to pull this panel off so now we can see what the inside looks like. So here's our burners. What's going to happen is our flame is going to light up here and it's going to heat up this section. But also the hot gases from that combustion process is going to continue to draft. What we see is that it's wider at the bottom and it gets a lot narrower. There's also all these little grooves in this heat exchanger, and the idea is surface area. What we're doing is having a lot of those gases back and forth, back and forth through the metal, so we have a lot of air touching it. On top of that, the system will also have these little baffles on the side that keep the air from the blower pushing against the side of the heat exchanger. This one's obviously going to be ruined because we've cut a big hole in it. One of the things that we look for is to see if there's any holes, even the slightest little crack inside this heat exchanger, because it can cause flue gas from inside the heat exchanger to leak into the house that's on the outside of the heat exchanger. And that's what poisons people. It's one of the big things we're always looking for in HVAC. 
You could simply pull the hair out, lay it against the heat exchanger, and that's enough of a crack, a hairline crack, to cause a big issue. Especially when this heat exchanger heats up, that crack that's heating up can open up and even let more flue gas out. So this is our burner. Our flames are going to be burning here inside this heat exchanger. The air from the blower is moving on the outside of the heat exchanger. So we're going to go back to the front side and we're going to break this down a little bit more. So that you can see these components, I'm going to take the flue pipe loose. I'm going to go ahead and take this top panel completely off. This is a collection box. So after we burn all the combustion air, both of these heat exchangers come together here and the idea is it naturally drafts out. If you were to put your hand up inside of here, you would get probably burnt from the hot gases coming out, but you could literally feel inside this heat exchanger. Here we have our combination gas valve with our pilot tube and our thermocouple. We're going to break that down in a little bit more detail later, but what we're going to do before we get there is get to the control for our uh, fan limit. So what I want to do is take this little screw out and we're going to take this diverter plate off. So now that I have this diverter plate out of the way, we can access our fan limit switch. This is going to be the control that not only brings our fan on, but this control also shuts off the combination gas valve if it gets too hot. By the end, we're going to take this furnace completely apart and we're going to lay out all the wiring so you can see all these components individually. So now if we want a lighter pilot light, we have to get access. So behind here is our burners and there's this little access plate on the top. So we're just going to take this little access plate off. and it gives us access to get to the burner assembly. So what we're gonna do next, we're gonna light this pilot light, and then we're gonna start this furnace up so you can see the basic operation of how it's supposed to work. I realize you're not gonna be able to see these components very easily right now. What we're gonna do is after we're done, take all these apart where you can see all these components. But their combination gas valve right now is set to off, which typically happens at the end of the summer. It's gonna be off. So in the winter time, we'd turn this to pilot, and we would hold this down. What this is going to do is allow gas to flow into this pilot tube. It forces a bypass. Now what it does is inside we have gas flowing, we have oxygen, but we still need heat. So I'm going to allow this lighter to ignite our pilot light. So if we see our pilot light is now ignited and we have the flame burning across this. This is our thermocouple. And we want the flame burning right on the very top eighth inch of that thermocouple. So the flame's burning on that thermocouple and this thermocouple when it heats up it's made of dissimilar metals that create voltage. That voltage is going to come back to an electromagnet that holds this valve open so I don't have to hold it here all the time. It takes about 30 seconds or so for that to happen, sometimes less. So I'm going to let off. As I let off of this valve, we see that the pilot light stays on. Typically, if the pilot light did not stay on, we'd have to replace our thermocouple. Now I want to take a little time here to note, I'm not promoting these gas furnaces. I really don't want anybody working on these gas furnaces. When you come across these old gas furnaces, I recommend replacing it with something a lot more safe and a lot more energy efficient. This is for educational purposes. So these pilot tubes right here where they connect are notorious for leaking gas through here. Also, if we notice I have this flexible connector coming into the furnace, that would never be allowed by codes today. You'd have to have a pipe coming all the way out of the furnace, a drip leg here at least three inches long, and your gas flex connecting to the top of it. I just have it lit up enough so that we can see this for operation for the educational purposes. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to energize the combination gas valve. What I've done is I've hot wired this unit so that when I plug it in, it's going to immediately cause those flames to come on. Now I always say on any gas furnace, you want to stand to the side of the furnace so when it lights up, and a flame comes rolling out, it doesn't hurt you. This can happen on modern units as well as old units. So we're gonna energize this. I'm gonna step back out of the way. We're gonna energize this, let the cameras take over, and you can see this furnace light up. And three, two, one. It's now energized. There'll be a slight delay, but we notice nothing happens. The, it's just the pilots that's on right now. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna unplug the furnace and we go back to this knob. We're going to take this knob that was on pilot and now turn it to the on position. So I did that on purpose so you'd understand that even if you energize this combination gas valve and it's sitting on pilot only, 
it just means that light's going to run. It's going to keep the whole system off. So now that we've turned this to on, it will allow the electronic controls to do its part. So we're going to try it again. So we have the combination gas valve turned from pilot to the on position. What I've done in this furnace is I've jumpered R to W, which is the same thing that the thermostat does. So when I plug this system in, it's going to automatically send 24 volts to the combination gas valve. It's going to cause the valve to open. Gas is going to flow through this manifold to the spud through the orifice where it mixes with primary air inside these burners. That's going to go across the pilot light, which is going to ignite into a flame that's going to burn inside the heat exchanger. Once the heat exchanger heats up enough, our fan limit switch, which is going to be right up here, this fan limit switch is going to bring the blower on. So that's going to be our sequence of operation. Anytime you start a furnace up, whether it's a new one or an old one, you always want to stand to the side because the flames are going to want to roll out if there's a problem. To save your mustache or your really nice beard, you want to make sure you're always standing to the side. So we're going to fire this furnace up and you're going to see if it has a flame roll out or not. Then I'm going to turn it to the side so you can see the flames burning inside that heat exchanger. And we're going to plug it in in three, two, one. Now on that camera, hopefully you notice that flame rolled out of this tube. That's a big issue and that's one of the reasons that this furnace was condemned. If we turn it to the side, you can see how the flame is burning inside that heat exchanger. Now you would never be able to see this in the field because we've cut that whole entire side of that heat exchanger off. Now we can adjust the air fuel mixture and change how this furnace is burning. If you notice there, the flames are way too high. And if I turn it back this other way, the flames are way too low. Now the flame should be blue with just a little bit of color on the tips of it. So this flame is not burning good at all, but then again we have the whole entire side of the heat exchanger cut off. What's important to realize is primary air is going in with the burners. That's the main air it needs to burn with. Secondary air is the air coming underneath or the air around the burners to ensure complete combustion. Again, these flames are the wrong color. So because we have it cut open, it's not going to work. Now what's really awesome is notice how the flames are changing. The blower now came on and it's moving air all around. This is making a very dangerous situation for me, but for you viewers it's going to be really great to understand what's happening. We always want to watch the flames when a unit comes on because if the blower comes on and the flames change, you know that there's a hole in that heat exchanger and you need to condemn that system. In this case, it's quite dramatic because the air is significantly moving it around. So this way you can actually see the difference in that flame. And I'm going to adjust the air to see if it changes it more. See the yellowness, we don't have enough oxygen. If I open this up, we have more oxygen, but still not enough. So that's what the flame's going to look like. And I just want to reiterate that there should be a sealed chamber right there. So the blower comes on, it's moving air from the house, and it should be on the outside of the heat exchanger. The flames burn on the inside of that heat exchanger. So if we turn the unit back this direction, you can see how this chamber is burning nice and clean. This other chamber over here is all over the place. And that's because of the air fuel mixture being messed up because there's a giant hole in there. The whole half of the heat exchanger is completely gone. So on this side, you can see the flames that are quite yellow. I'm going to adjust the air and see how they turn really, really yellow. So we're going to open it back up. Now I'm not condoning or asking anybody to work on these. I really see if you have a standing pilot gas furnace, it's time to be changed. This is for educational purposes so you understand air fuel mixture in these old systems. This guy was condemned for a reason. Even with fully opened air, it's not burning very well at all. So this is our basic operation. So what I'm going to do is back the camera up just a little bit here. What we're going to do is let you see the operation of the whole entire system. So we're going to move the camera up. This is our fan limit switch. This is what's controlling the fan. So once the heat exchanger got warm enough, the fan limit switch turned on and starts moving air into the house. If we were to pull that fan limit switch out, it would look something like this or exactly like this. The heat exchanger is putting off heat and it's heating up this bimetal, causing this to twist. As this twist, it moves these little pins over here, and once these pins close, it brings the fan on on one side. This closes a high voltage switch that allows low speed of that fan to come on. If for whatever reason I was to shut the fan motor off, we would continue to get warmer and warmer and warmer. 
And what would happen is if we continue to get warmer, it would, as a safety, shut the flames off. So we're gonna do that step right now. I'm gonna manually turn this dial. Now, again, you wouldn't be working in these gas furnaces, and even if you were, it was never a good idea to manually turn these, but since this system's gonna be trashed anyways, I'm gonna go ahead and do that. So I'm gonna turn it past if it is to overheat. And if it is to get too hot, we actually shut our flames off as a safety. But notice that the blower stays on, so it can cool it off. Once it cools off enough, the flames reignite, and notice we have that rollout issue, and the system keeps going. As a secondary safety, there's this, it's called a fusible link. This fusible link's designed to melt. It's set for a higher temperature than this limit. So if the limit was to overheat, and for some reason not shut the system off, this one would melt and shut the combination gas valve, shutting that whole entire system down. So what I'm gonna do is unplug this so you can see exactly what happens, as if it was to break. So we're just gonna pull one of these wires loose. And the scary side is this system did not shut off. So this system has been bypassed. I'm gonna just pull the wire off the combination gas valve entirely. There we go. And now we can see the flames shut off in the system. So this system is in, definitely has some major issues as well as notice this gas flex running in would never be allowed by code today. There would have to be a solid piece of pipe coming out with a three inch drip leg on the side. And on top of that, that's where the gas would actually hook up. But this is just so you guys can see the operation. Now what I want you to focus on is this fan limit switch. The heat is off, just the fan is on. So it's cooling the system down and you'll see that this dial will start turning back the other way and it's going to click. Now, I realize that you can't see this very clearly right now, but what we're gonna do is pull all these components out so you can get a really good look at them and see the operation all separated and lined out. This side of the fan limit switch is high voltage controlling the fan. Essentially, this side is just a fan switch. Now that it got cool enough, it shut the fan off by breaking the high voltage. This side should be a low voltage side, so it's only the 24 volts. Now, I don't want you replacing these components, but when you bought these replacements, they had a jumper here, and you had to pull that jumper out to separate them, so one side would be high voltage and one side would be low voltage. There was many different scenarios, and some of them used a high voltage switch to shut the power off to the entire system. So now we can see that whole entire unit's off. It's a very simple dial. If I manually turn this, we get to the same point where we can actually bring that fan motor on by itself, and if I let go, it shuts it off. So that's our operation of it. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna start pulling these pieces off so you can see what's happening. Before we do our next step, what I'm gonna do is disconnect the thermocouple. So if I disconnect the thermocouple, we're gonna manually unscrew this thermocouple, and what it should do is kill the combination gas valve for sure. So I unhooked this thermocouple, it immediately killed the electromagnet to the valve, and it immediately shut off the flames for that standing pilot. The idea is if you had a backdraft or any situation that would shut the, that cause that flame to blow out, this unit shuts off and doesn't allow any gas to be leaking out. It also prevents this gas valve from opening so that we don't dump a whole bunch of gas into somebody's house when they don't need that. So in a gas furnace, we've already taken this uh, protective cover plate off, and here we have our draft hood collector and we have our flue pipe. So I'm gonna take the flue pipe off and you don't wanna hold this too long because you might end up with the flue. So if I take the flue pipe off, I tried to get off of work one time with that, but the boss would let me. So we take the flue pipe off, we just have our collector box. So we take the collector box off, you notice it's just a hollow piece right here. This allowed for the delusion air to come in through the hole earlier. The idea behind that is it slows down the draft. Remember this is a natural draft furnace. So if we looked on the side and we see that the flames are burning here, and natural convection, the heat of that, the uh, natural heat as it's expanding is going to cause it to draft up. And if it drafts up too fast, we're pulling the flames off of here. We're also losing a whole lot of that extra heat. So having this delusion air, it helps slow that down the proper amount. The engineers designed, designed to see how big those needed to be. But here you can see the heat exchanger. So the start of the heat exchanger is down here where the burners are. And then they ended here and they collected together to go into one flue pipe. So this is the basics of our furnace. You can see here's our fan control. On this side here, we have our uh, transformer. We have our relay for the furnace, for the blower. We have our combination gas valve, our pilots, our manifold, our burners. It's a pretty simple system. On the bottom side, I'm going to take this back off. 
we have our blower and our door safety switch or door interlock. What we're going to do next is we're going to take this blower and I'm going to show you a few little key points of this. This is really nice because some of these have had a pin you could pull, some only have one screw, but the idea is that you can pull this blower out because it's on tracks, so it slides out very nice, very easily. Now that I have it pulled back, we're going to bring the camera in so you guys can get a better view of this. So here we have our blower. This is what's moving the air, pulling the return air from the house, blowing the air across the heat exchanger and back into the house. Some things I want to point out to you, this is the wiring from our control. We have three wires here. This red wire is our low speed. So in our fan limit switch, the fan side of the switch, when it closed, it sent power 115 volts through this wire to energize the motor, do work, and then it came home through this white wire here. Now if we notice the black wire, this is our high speed. This is going to be for cooling. Our fan relay and the fan control of this would energize this one for high speed only. You can only run one speed at a time. So you're either going to run low speed for heating or you'd run high speed. On the thermostat, if you energize the fan, it would connect R to G, closing the relay, energizing the high speed. We do work, we come home through the common, which is the white on the white wire. See how here that there's these yellow butt connectors? That means that the last technician or one of the technicians that worked in this cut the wires to pull the blower quickly and easily. Now they did a decent job of putting it back together, but I really don't like doing that because over time, every time somebody cut the wires, they get shorter and shorter and shorter. Now you have an issue of the last guy not having enough wire to put it back together. If we take this little protective cover off, just two screws on here, we can get to all the wires right here. And it's important to take this cover off anyways because what we can see is the last guy didn't put the wire cap on correctly. These are actually too large for this size of wire and the wires are sitting here exposed. So that's an issue. So what I'm going to do is disconnect these wires. We take the, and you don't need electrical tape. If you have to use electrical tape to hold these caps on, you're using the wrong size cap or you're not doing it right. When you put these wire nuts on here, they should hold the wire nice and tight and you should be able to pull them and they don't come loose. So there's no need for electrical tape. All electrical tape does is just make a gooey mess. So this one, they actually taped it decent, but it's still going to make a gooey mess. Let's see if they did it tight uh, and it just pulled right off of there. So those are some of the things you want to do is find the wires. I just got to disconnect those three wires from the wire caps inside this little electrical box. I'm going to get rid of all this old tape and you pull those three wires out. So now, you can see how ridiculous it looks having these connectors here when it was only an extra few inches of wire on there. Once we pull that out of the way, we can pull this whole entire blower out of the housing and it's just on these really nice, easy tracks. Even the new furnaces still are on these tracks, which makes it pretty nice for us. Now that we have this blower out, there's some things I want to bring to your attention. One of the things is these two wires right here. These are reversible wires. By me seeing those wires, I know that this motor's been replaced before. Factory motors only turn in one direction and aren't reversible. Our universal motors that we carry in our service fans are universal, so one motor can fit many different applications. In that case, this motor's been replaced before. That's not unusual for as old as this system is, but what I do want to point out is this chamber right here to this little plug. On this plug, it says OIL for oil. Now this motor, when it is installed, somebody installed it incorrectly. The oil port should be facing up and down. So the oil runs down into the bearing inside of here. By it being this way, the oil runs away from it. Now they don't make oil ports anymore. So all this is really irrelevant. The new motors are sealed from the factory for life. They're non-oilable. On this system, it should be facing up and down, and the problem with these oil ports were either A, they never got oiled, or B, people put too much oil. We had a product called Zoom Spout that was a high-grade turbine oil, and we'd put about three drops of oil in there, and that's all it needed for the bearings. But also, there was another port just like this on the very front for the front bearings. That Zoom Spout had an extendable spout that reached into the front that allowed us to oil that as well. So this motor, even though it's still working, we noticed that it had a hard time starting up and it's probably because those bearings are starting to go bad. We're going to turn this motor around so we can get to the access ports for the set screw. Now on this motor, we're not going to really use this motor, but I just want to show you what we would do if we were going to work on it. One of the things I would do is take my adjustable wrench. The fewer tools in your tool bag, the better because you want to keep it as light as possible. So this adjustable wrench I'm going to put on 
and I'm gonna put it down like so. Now what's important is notice how it's holding itself together. I'm gonna to apply pressure to break that set screw loose and what I'm gonna do is use the palm of my hand and press down on this adjustable wrench. If I push down on this wrench and it falls, nothing happens, no injury at all. I push on it again, I push down, notice it came straight down, my hands are protected, nothing's gonna to happen to them. A lot of people wanna to try to loosen it by putting it like so and they're fighting it. When it finally breaks loose, your knuckles go right to the edge of these fins and you end up getting cut knuckles. This being rusted metal and all of the dirt and air from people's houses flowing through this, that's not where you wanna end up with a cut. So once we get the set screw loose, we're gonna go ahead and loosen it up a little bit more to make sure there's plenty of slack on this. We can see that this motor is severely rusted. Most likely the evaporator coil had been leaking down to this entire system. The other thing you see on this shaft is it's extremely rusted. So before we're able to get this blower wheel off, we're gonna have to sand this shaft down. So what we're gonna do is speed this up and we'll show you exactly what we're doing. Now we can see this shaft is nice and shiny. So what I use is that same exact turbine oil that we'll put on here to go ahead and lubricate this shaft. So we'll put this oil on, lubricate it all up, and also what I like to do is turn the blower to where it's facing like this. That way the oil is going down inside of that hub connector. What you want to remember is do not use any kind of penetrating spray on these blowers. When you use this kind of spray, it'll get into the bearing and what it will do is it will separate the oil inside those bearings. That will cause harm. This can damage the motor. Even if you're using it just for the shaft, it can seep down inside and cause damage. So I don't even let my techs keep that in their truck. What we use is the high grade turbine oil, the Zoom Spout brand, and now that oil is working its way inside. While it's working its way inside, I take my adjustable wrench again and I put part of the adjustable wrench on the flat of this shaft. Now that it's on there, I can hold the fins with one hand and I can take the shaft and I can start to move it. What that's gonna do is work the oil down inside the hub and now it's getting easier and easier to turn. I'm gonna loosen the set screw a little bit more to allow us to turn it all the way around. And I put my adjustable wrench back on the flat again and I just start working it. Now, the blower will if you heard that squeaking noise, is now dropped down to the other side. What I like to then do is take my sand cloth and down inside next to the hub, I wanna go ahead and sand it one more time to make sure there's no ring of rust holding me up. Now this whole entire shaft is sanded nice and clean, and then we're gonna turn the motor back over to the other side. This way, I can get to these three bolts. Now a lot of technicians like to keep uh, nut drivers it has the shaft on it to the size. Some people like to carry a socket set for all these sizes, but you really need to think light is better. So if you have all those extra tools trying to undo this, that's extra weight you're carrying around, extra work on your back. I like to just use an adjustable wrench to break it loose. I already have it in my tool bag. I've already used it several other times. And we break these loose and we can just unscrew these bolts by hand. It doesn't take very much effort at all. While I'm unscrewing that, I'm also going to take this control panel off. So I'm gonna use a Phillips screwdriver and loosen this control panel at the same time. One screw, one more screw left. And we also have this nice little wire bracket. A lot of techs cut this off, but I like to leave them there because I want to put it back, make it look really nice and clean, keep the wires together. This system also has a ground screw. It's very important that we also put that ground screw back when we're done. This motor is insulated by rubber grommets. So if the motor was to short out, it would short out and it would just be energized. Somebody would touch it, they could get shocked. By having the ground screw to metal, it's grounded to motor, metal to metal to the metal of the casing, if it shorts out, it's gonna trip a breaker instead of potentially hurting anybody. So now we can see all the wires are separated from the motor. So now if we reach our hand down inside of this 
housing, I can actually pull the motor right on up and out. So now we have our motor separated. Then we have our blower wheel and our blower housing. If I was doing maintenance, I would take this outside, use a water hose, spray water to this direction, and it sprays out the side, and I would wash this blower wheel. This one's extremely rusted up, so I'm going to go through the extra steps you would take if you're going to replace this blower wheel. There's going to be a screw right here on each side, so I'm just going to take this screw out. And we're going to turn it over, and we have another screw, just like it on the other side. And what that allows us to do is take this piece off. This piece has a sp very special name. It's called a cutoff plate, and it allows for the blower to build the pressure up to throw air through. We had a service call where we're having a huge problem with airflow. Come to find out, a technician took the wheel out to clean it, and he didn't put this plate back in, and it caused a big issue. With that plate removed, we can pull our blower out very easy. This is a centrifugal style blower, which means it's spinning and it's pulling air from the insides and throwing it out to the top. If you were to put this motor in backwards, it wouldn't be moving any air at all. So it has to be in the correct way. And if we can see this one's severely rusted. The other thing that we would do is we would check these fins to make sure they were tight. Sometimes you have an issue with these fins will start working their way loose and this blower wheel is gonna come apart. That's always caused by airflow. So if you have an issue with these blower fins coming loose, you have an issue with airflow. The return air is too small, the supplier is too small, the speed's wrong, or somebody may have even put the wrong size motor in. But that's this blower wheel. Now we're gonna take a look at the motor. If I was inspecting this motor during maintenance, I would hold it down flat, and what I would do is take the shaft and move the shaft back and forth. I would check for any play in the bearings. On this motor, I do have just barely a little play in the bearings, and that's probably because it wasn't oiled. The other thing I would do was I would check my capacitor. So what we would do is we would unscrew the wires, the uh, two screws on the each side of the capacitor. We'd pull our wires loose. We'd pull this little plate off. This one is really tight. We'll leave the plate on. So we would discharge the 20,000 ohm 5 volt resistor and check it with our meter to make sure it was with tolerance. This meter is a 5 microfarad 370 VAC capacitor. Anytime you replace a motor, you also put in a new capacitor. You never want to put this old capacitor with a new motor. So let's say that our motor is bad and we're going to replace this motor. We'd have to take it off from the bracket. So here we have our clamp style bracket that holds it. We get the new motor, we're going to have to reuse this old bracket. Also, now you can see the oil ports. These ports would come off. If we have a pair of pliers with us, we could easily pull these tabs off. But instead of going to the truck and grabbing another, another tool, I'm gonna to use my adjustable wrench. And we're gonna loosen this screw right here. And in this case, this bracket's not coming loose. I'm wanting to get another wrench. So in this case, we walk back to the truck, we grab us another wrench. Let me pause it. So we went back to the truck and we grab another tool. It's okay to make an extra trip back to the truck. And again, this is an old system, so it's really not gonna be applicable. So what we do is we take this, get it nice and loose. Now that it's loose, these little brackets will slide out. We got one, two, and three. Once those brackets are out of the way, this band very easily slides right off. And I can clean this up and use this for the new motor if we're gonna put a new motor in. Now that we got this out of the way, we can take these little oil ports, I can pull them out. That's all it looks like. You can just take a, your thermostat screwdriver or a knife, something, and just pop these right out. And that gives us access to the oil ports. And if we notice a lot of oil was on this, that means all the oil had left the bearings and was sitting right there at these little plugs. So again, irrelevant because you don't see these anymore. We're just going through all the components of this old furnace. So now that this motor's done and out of the way, let's break down the next part of this furnace. 
So we got the blower all taken apart and we talked about everything with that. Now let's talk about the burners and the rest of it. So what we need to do is shut the gas off, which you already did, and we're going to take loose this gas line. Now remember this gas line should never be installed like this anyways. There should never be a flex inside of this compartment. But we're going to take this loose and out of the way. That disconnects our main gas. I'm going to also disconnect the two wires for our combination gas valve. One wire and two wires. Also these two wires for a limit switch. Now if you were doing this you'd want to make sure that you wrote down where the wires went and some people even tag these wires so they know exactly where they went. So these wires are out of the way. There's nothing now connecting the gas valve except for the manifold, the pilot tube, and the thermocouple. So what we're going to do on this particular model is I'm going to take out the burners and the combination gas valve together as one entire set. You can take the gas valve out separate, and in some models you need to, but you also have to separate the pilot tube and the thermocouple. So we're just going to take these four screws out. You already heard it shift its weight. Now this should come all out as one full assembly. So here we have the combination gas valve, the burner tube, we have the jets, uh, sorry, the orifices and the spuds, we have the main burners, we got our pilot lights and our thermocouple and the burners. And you can see that there's a whole lot of soot and stuff on this and buildup and flakes. This is what we would clean out in the field. We would actually, in the old days, take a wire brush and clean and all of these little tubes to make sure they were clean and clear. These were stamp style burners. With this out of the way, what we would then do is take and inspect inside the heat exchanger. We could take a mirror, lay a mirror inside there and a light, and we could look up through the heat exchanger. Some companies even put water on the outside of the heat exchanger and look for any stains on the inside. There's also now adapters you have for your phone you could actually snake inside the heat exchanger. Again, this is an old heat exchanger, but that adapter for your phone could still play into effect today with the newer style heat exchangers. The other thing that we would did in the old days is we took a vacuum, a shop vac with an extension, and we cleaned out all the rust that would build up in these heat exchangers. Now, I always wanted to make sure I wrote down how much rust came out, just approximately. I also wanted to show the customer how much rust came out. Because if you think about it, all of the rust that you pull out is the metal of the heat exchanger. The rust that you pull out is what's separating the combustion gases, the carbon monoxide, from the air of the house. So if your heat exchanger rusts out or you get a crack in it, that's going to be a very severe issue. So once we got this lower, uh, sorry, the burner assembly out, we're going to focus in on just these burners. All right, as promised, we're going to show you how to light the pilot light. So here is our knob. This is the marking point. So right now it's off. We're going to turn it to where pilot lines up with that little mark right there. That allows us to push this knob down. If it's on the off position, it won't allow us to push down, but we have it to pilot, it allows us to push down. When I push down on this, it bypasses the safety in here and allows gas to flow through this pilot tube to the pilot. So now that we got it held down, we have to then overcome our child safety uh, lighter. And now we can light the pilot. So I'm holding this down and I have to hold this down long enough for these flames to burn across this thermocouple tip right here. Once it burns across the thermocouple tip, this will has, it has dissimilar metals inside that when heated creates voltage. That voltage is going to run over to an electromagnet that's going to hold this valve open for me, so I won't have to keep pushing it down. It takes about 30 seconds or so. We'll see if it's been long enough. As I let off, it holds the pilot for us. So I'm going to show you a little bit more detail how that works. Here I have an extra thermocouple, and I've taken the solenoid valve out of a combination gas valve. And if you see here, as I push up and down, this is free flow. There's just a spring keeping it pushed open. What's going to happen if I manually hold this valve down and I put the thermocouple into that flame to let it start getting hot, and then I let go of this valve, it holds it in place. So it's holding the valve open. Now when I take the thermocouple away from the flame, it's going to take it a little bit to cool off but it's going to stop creating voltage and current and it will allow this to spring to pop it back out. So if we wait for it long enough, it should pop back out on its own. It's taking a little bit longer than usual. So if you see when you stop, uh, when your pilot light blows out, 
you're still going to be leaking a little bit of gas before this cools off enough to de-energize this electromagnet. And there it is. It cooled off enough to drop voltage enough so it stopped having a flow of electricity, so we killed our electromagnet. So that's how that works. When I push that valve in, it's manually holding this open, allowing gas to flow there. Once the thermocouple gets warm enough, it's going to hold this valve in for us. And that's what's happening now. There's no electricity hooked up to it. It's just the valve holding it on. So I'm going to turn this to the on position now. And now it's ready to light. So even if the power goes out, it's its own little energy system right here that's keeping that pilot lit. So what we're going to do next, I'm going to step back out of the way, and we're going to energize 24 volts, the combination gas valve. This is going to allow gas to flow through the manifold, to the spuds, through the orifice, mixing with primary air inside the burners. It's going to go across this pilot light. It's going to ignite into a flame burning down both of these burners, and that should be burning in the heat exchanger. This little tube right here is a crossover tube. No matter how many burners I had, this tube would extend all the way across all of them, and it allows us to light every single burner. So what we're going to do next, I'm going to stand back out of the way. We'll zoom out a little bit so you can see the full picture, and we're going to ignite these burners. Here we go in three, two, one. There we go. Now the burners are running without any, uh, any heat exchanger, anything connected to it. 24 volts opens that combination gas valves. And those are some really ugly flames, but you can see how those burners work. And when we de-energize the combination gas valve, it immediately kills the 24 volts, closing the main valve, but the pilot valve stays on. So that is how our system's operating. Now the next thing I wanna show you, if I disconnect our thermocouple, it's going to immediately shut off that pilot light. And I don't know if you heard that click or not, but once I loosen this up, it killed the voltage, this little solenoid, shut off all the gas flow. Now, even if I turn this on and plug this system in, you may or may not hear the click of the gas valve, but it will not open, it will not let gas through. This nice little click going on there. It's energizing a solenoid, but because this valve is first, it won't let gas go past it to energize the rest of it. So that's our safety features. Pretty much the one of the two safety features on the entire system. It's very limited on safety features. That's how this combination gas valve and these burners work. So what I'm gonna do next is we're gonna isolate all these other components. Now that we've taken this out, we can get to everything else. And inside between the uh, pilot light and the thermocouple is on this particular model, one single screw. So what I'm gonna do is put my screwdriver right inside of here and take that one single screw loose. Now that allows this whole assembly to be free, but I wanna also take it loose from the combination gas valve. So we're gonna take our adjustable wrench and usually I like to keep a nice small adjustable wrench for these, but now that these systems are really out of date, there's not much need for it anymore. Once we get it loosened, it's usually just hand tight and I can unscrew the rest of this fitting. So now I've already taken the thermocouple loose and the pilot tube loose, and now we can look at just this pilot assembly right here. So I'm gonna move the burner out of the way and we can take a look at this pilot assembly. So this is our thermocouple. What we used to do is every time we had a customer during maintenance contract, we would replace our thermocouple and there's a few different types, but there was a universal kit we'd replace it with. But they pulled out from that assembly and this is our thermocouple. Dissimilar metals, when heated, create current or creates voltage applied to a coil, created with current, and had electromagnet. So these were, would be your number one fail issue. If I tried to hold the pilot and light it and it wouldn't stay lit, this is usually the culprit. So this is our thermocouple, and this is our pilot assembly and pilot tube. The new guys in the field would notoriously uh, be working with these and they would break these tubes. This one's been overbent. Somebody's bent it too much and it's really kinked right there. And notice all these really horrible teeth marks right here on the top of this brass piece. Somebody's tried to put pliers in there and tried to work it and most likely if we were to put soap bubbles around this we'd see that that was leaking. So that was a very common issue. I used to keep these kits on my truck to fix the ones the last guy had messed up. So next what we're going to do is look inside of this pilot assembly. And we'll see if it's going to cooperate. Oh, it is. It's actually going to let us unscrew it. 
here is our pilot assembly, and that's just a hole there. But what's interesting about this pilot assembly is on the end right here, this is its own little orifice right there. There's a very special size hole in that. This fitting slides up inside of here. So this restricts the flow of gas, just like the orifice does in these big burners. It restricts the flow of gas, regulates how much gas is coming through. If we have the set amount of pressure, this keeps our flame burning correct. I've seen people before try to clean this hole out and they'll put a screw in there and it makes the hole way too big and you have this ginormous pilot flame blowing. It's really, all this is irrelevant because if you see one of these pilot systems, it's really time for an upgrade again. This is just for your information here. So this was the uh, orifice side for the pilot. It would slide in like this. This was the hose kit. Like I say, these are notoriously for uh, technicians messing these up. And actually this has a whole lot of Teflon on here or pipe dope or some kind of yuckiness on here. So somebody was having an issue with this leaking and they put a whole bunch of this on trying to fix it. That's not the answer. Uh, the answer is this tube was just bent up and tore up and that's why it was leaking. So this furnace was really uh, needed to be replaced. I'm glad that somebody finally did replace it. So this is the pilot assembly and the thermocouple. Once we get that out of the way, let's go and break down a little bit more about this furnace. Next on our journey of destruction, we're gonna go ahead and t separate the manifold from the burners. So I was gonna take this last screw off, I've already loosened the other ones up to make this process a little bit faster. But these screws notoriously get rusted uh, just from all the heat. So we separate that, these are our burners. So here's our combination gas valve. And I say it's a combination gas valve because it's a pressure regulator and a solenoid valve. So we energize our solenoid valve with our 24 volts here. We have a separate solenoid valve for our pilot assembly, and on top of that, we also have our pressure regulator. This screw on the very top right here, if we take this cover off, behind it is our adjustment for a pressure regulator. So if we loosen this up, we have a pressure regulator adjustment there. So I can adjust the pressure in the manifold. So it's called manifold pressure. It's the pressure in this manifold. On the side, we have this little tap, and it says pressure tap. This gives us the pressure for the manifold. So we'd unscrew that, we'd put an adapter in there, and we'd adjust to get the manifold pressure correct for the system. This particular system um, had a manifold setting of, and it's completely worn away, the tag on this is completely gone. But that's how this system works. So I'll put this little cap back on here just because old habits die hard. Uh, you never want to lose these parts. If we had to replace this combination gas valve, we'd want to take and put our pipe wrench here and also our adjustable wrench here and we would unscrew this. And these are notoriously hard to get loose. They often get very stuck and it's very stubborn to get them loose. That would leave us with just this pipe here and this pipe is called the manifold. And these fittings are called our spuds and our spuds are removable. So I can easily remove this with an adjustable wrench. And the reason you'd want to remove these spuds is if you were changing it from natural gas to propane, or if you were changing the altitude. So if you had a system and you were installing it in a higher altitude area, you'd have to change out these orifices or these spuds so that you could fit for the proper gas fuel mixture. Higher altitude has less oxygen available, so you have to adjust that size. This fitting that I'm taking off is called a spud. I don't know why they call it a spud, it is. The main thing is the hole that's in the center is called an orifice. So another word for a hole is an orifice. So you have different size spuds that essentially just have a different size hole there. Um, it's very important that these are sized correctly and this one has a whole lot of soot in there. So the second reason that you would clean this is, or take this out is to clean it. Uh, you can use tubing cleaners and little brushes and you can clean all that out. But that's one of the reasons this has been flashing back. They probably had a problem with this manifold uh, pressure being too low the gas burned back inside of this um, spud and orifice and that got into the manifold. So this system, as severe as this is, there's as much black soot as there is in there, this is supposed to be brass. This is supposed to be a shiny brass color. Uh, so this system was definitely uh, beyond its, its life expectancy. But this is a combination gas valve, our manifold. Now, let's talk about the burners. Earlier I talked about adjusting the gas pressure. Uh, sorry, I apologize, adjusting the oxygen. And these, this is what I would turn for adjusting the oxygen. Now those spuds 
would mount right in the very, very center of this. So the spud would be right here and it's shooting the gas to the very center. As it's shooting the gas to the very center of this, it's gonna be pulling oxygen into the side and not just oxygen, but our full air. So when we're burning that, it's shooting the gas through and it's pulling the air with the oxygen on the side. This is primary air. The air that's mixing inside of these burners is primary air. The air around the burners, the extra air that's around the flame, this is called excess air. It ensures complete combustion. If you're in class in school, those are the terms that's gonna be on this test. Another classroom term is this is called a crossover tube. But in the old days when we had to clean these, we would take a wire brush and we made sure we took a wire brush and see all this black on here? We take a wire brush and we would just brush this and notice how clean and shiny it gets. But more importantly, we wanna get the brush bristles inside of all of these little tubes of this stamped steel. And we'd of course do this outside and it usually makes a heck of a mess as well as some really annoying noises. Gives you an idea. I would do this whole entire section forward and backwards. I would take and turn it upside down to get all of the uh, particles that I cleaned out. And then I would take my nitrogen tank or CO2 tank, put it through here and blow all this out to make sure it's nice and clean. But these are the burners. Uh, the job of a burner is to direct the flame and mix the air and the fuel together. So that's our burners. Next, we're gonna take apart the rest of the components for the wiring. And we'll do that here in just a moment. As we continue on with our path of destruction or autopsy of this furnace, we're going to continue to take a few more of these components off. And this is going to be what we call our fusible link. So one screw on this takes this component out and this would be wired in series. And this fits up between, through this hole between the two heat exchangers. Remember there's one heat exchanger here and the second one here. This is fitting in the airflow side between them. So this is a fusible link. If the furnace got too hot, this link would literally melt and break the two wires. It would shut off the combination gas valve, shut off the power to it, so it would shut down. Anytime you're having an issue with any kind of limit, you need to be thinking airflow. It's not that it's getting too hot by fire, it's getting too hot because you're not moving enough air across it. So you gotta be thinking dirty filter, something with the blower motor, blower motor not working, clogged evaporator close, anything with airflow. So that's a fusible link. When this melted, you would have to replace this component. I remember in the day they would have issues with these would, would go bad and a technician would go and just bypass it. Never bypass the safety, especially when this is a backup. This one is set to melt at a higher temperature than this limit set. So that means this one failed and this one failed. So uh, you wanna make sure that you replace them. They have a lot of little numbers on there. You can usually look those up. Our other control is our fan limit switch and notice I put a big pause between fan and limit switch because it is a fan switch and it's also a limit switch in one component and not that it's relevant in today's world but it's important to know that they were two different components mounted in one housing so we're going to take these screws out of this and I'll pull this out so you can see exactly what it looks like Now we got those screws out, three screws out, and this whole piece is going to slide right on out of here. And it looks just like the example I showed you. This was bimetal. When it heats up, it tries to contract or expand. And what it's doing is turning this dial here that controls the fan and also separately the switch. In this case, the fan switch is high voltage. The limit switch is low voltage, so there's no control between it. In the old days, these would rust up and these had to be replaced pretty often and they were expensive. Notice this insulation that's on here. This was insulation used as a gasket to not only control the heat from this getting metal getting hot to these components, but also so we didn't leak any air through there. So it has a double fold. And if I put my finger through here, I can touch the heat exchanger on this side and also the heat exchanger on this side. So again, if this is tripping from too, getting too hot, it had an issue to do with airflow. In our day, we had to adjust 
these little points, these were actually adjustable. We had to adjust these little points uh, to make the furnace come on and off as we needed or as, as it was intended. Now I'm gonna leave this wires hooked up, but I'm gonna now take off the two components for our fan control center. Now it says big fancy words like fan control center, but in reality, all it is is a relay and a transformer with terminals built in together. For example, our connectors such as R, 24 volt power, C, 24 volt common, W, heat, and Y, just a drop point for our outdoor condenser. So you loosen the screws, this whole piece just slides right out. And on this side, we have our relay, our transformer, and just all of our wire connectors. And this is where the unit is wired up with our external power plug. From there, our wires just run down to our door interlock and our blower. So what I'm gonna do with this, I'm gonna pull all these wires and separate them with a schematic so we can show you about how the wires go and how simple this component really is. All right, so I've separated all the wiring out to where we can see it relatively easy. Um, I wanted to point out a few things though. One of the things is I saw this while I was taking the wires out and you can see how this is two different size wires. And when I untied some of the electrical tape, we saw they did connections like that. So what that means is improper connection. The guy didn't have the correct uh, tools at the time. What really worrisome is they went from stranded wire to solid wire, which is a big no-no, along with electrical tape is not a good way to seal any connection. What the reason that happened though was because it most likely had a flame rollout and it burned it. I noticed this relay was severely burned. We had burn marks in here and our knob for our combination gas valve had been melted. So they definitely had some severe issues in the past. But let's roll through some of the wiring. Here I have the ladder diagram as well as all the components lined out. On our ladder diagram, we start with line one and neutral. And our line one will be our black wire here and our neutral will be coming together here. So we're gonna start with line one and our ladder diagram says it goes into a switch. So if we follow line one, we go over here into our switch and this is our door interlock or door safety switch. Once we leave that switch, we go to everything else, which is only two other components. So we go into our switch and we come out of our switch and now we're going to two different components. One of the components we're going to is the common side of our fan relay. So we follow this yellow wire, we're going to the common side of our fan relay. The other wire goes all the way down here to our transformer. So that is so far, we're in line. So let's follow the path of electricity. Electricity flows to this side of the switch, which is normally open, which means it can't flow to high speed. So no path of power can go. And the other side is normally closed. That means there is a path of power from this line one, from the yellow wire over here to the red wire. If I follow this path of power, we go to this component here, which is the fan side of our fan limit switch. And here we have the symbol that says normally open. It closes on temperature rise, also known as an open on temperature drop. So right now the temperature is too low, so this switch is open. So electricity goes to this point here and cannot go any farther. Once this closes, it will then continue on to our low speed. Whether we do, high speed, whether we do work on the high speed, medium speed, or low speed, we then come home to the opposite side. So high speed goes to the motor to the black wire, low speed goes to the motor on the black wire, and we have neutral not being used. Here we have the symbol for a capacitor, the two wires going to a capacitor, as well as we have our two wires going to a capacitor, and neutral goes home to the opposite side, neutral goes home to the opposite side. Electricity will continue down to our transformer, so into the switch, out of the switch, over here in our transformer we do work with an inductive load, after we do work, we want to go home to the opposite side, in this case is neutral. So if I follow this wire, we go home to the opposite side, which is neutral. That's all of the high voltage wiring. So it's very simple on the high voltage side. Now let's go down to the low voltage side. The transformer changes it from high voltage to low voltage. So high voltage comes in on the primary side, and here's our low voltage. What's interesting about these old style units is they actually had all the connectors for the thermostats built right onto the transformer. So we have the letter over here. It'll probably be difficult to see in the video, but uh, this letter right here is R, which stands for 24 volt power, which on our schematic is R right here, 24 volt power. We also have the letter uh, common. So this is common coming over the opposite side. And we also have the letter G. G is gonna stand for a fan relay. We have the letter Y, which is gonna be for cooling, which doesn't apply to anything on this system. 
and we also have the letter W. W is going to go to our combination gas valve eventually. So our 24 volt power starts here and would normally go to our thermostat. I left the thermostat out, but this is our 24 volt power right here. If the thermostat called for heating, it would connect R to W. It would connect these two wires. W would go over here to our limit side of our stand switch. Notice this side of our switch is low voltage, 24 volts. And this switch is normally closed and it opens on temperature rise. So normally the switch stays closed. If the temperature gets too high, that will cause this switch to open. If we continue following this, we go to a fusible link. So this is a fusible link. It's normally closed. It does open on temperature, but it's a permanent opening. So we call that a fusible link. And if we continue on that, we get to our load of our combination gas valve. So pretty neat, simple system. Want to do work at a combination gas valve, we go home to the common side of our transformer. If the thermostat calls for fan, it's going to connect R to G. So I connect R to G. We send 24 volts to the load side of our fan relay. What that does is this, if I energize this, it changes the switch side. So instead of the normally open here, normally closed, it does the opposite. We open this side so it shuts off low speed and then it will permanently energize high speed. Once we do low voltage work, we go to low voltage home. Very simple uh, wiring schematic. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna operate this system so you can see exactly what's happening. Right now, electricity goes to the switch and it stays open. Our door switch is open. So we're gonna have to manually override that door switch. So I'm just gonna put a metal plate on that to hold it. Now our system is energized. Electricity goes to here. Can't go anywhere, can't go anywhere. The only thing energized is our transformer. So we'll do the first thing. We'll call for heat, uh, just for fan. So I'm gonna connect the R terminal, just like the thermostat would do, R to W. I'm sorry, R to G for the fan. So what happened in our switch here, once I energized R to G, we energized the low voltage side of our fan relay. So 24 volt, volt electromagnet here closed the high voltage switch here. So we connected R to G. Now electricity flows to the high speed of the fan motor, does work, comes home to neutral on the opposite side. Very simple, when I disconnect R to G, the fan motor cycles off. It goes back to its normal position. So the next question would be, what would happen if we called for heating? So we're gonna connect R to W, and you can hear the combination gas valve energizing. We'll follow it through with our schematic. We connect R to W. We flow through our normally closed limit, through our fusible link, energizing our combination gas valve. Now we still heard the solenoid open and close, but nothing's gonna happen because we do not have the pilot valve energized. With that system being off, even though the solenoid opens, it will not allow gas to flow through the system. So the system will be completely off. Nothing's gonna happen. Now, if this was energized, we'd have gas flowing through the manifold to the spuds to the orifice, mixing with primary air across the hot surface, uh, in this case, a pilot light burning into a flame burning inside that heat exchanger. In this case, nothing's gonna happen with the fan until this fan limit switch gets hot enough to bring that switch on. So this fan limit switch, this part of the switch here, is on this component right now. So what I'm gonna do is heat up this bimetal strip so that this dial will start to turn so that this switch will close and then we'll see what happens. The dial's turning very quickly. And we heard a little click here. Once we got to temperature, this switch closed right here, energizing voltage from line one to go through to the motor, do work and come home to the opposite side. So right now, this switch was normally closed to this wire here, which this switch just now closed that switch closed, sent power to our fan motor, does work, comes home to the opposite side. Once this cools down enough, then it's gonna shut that motor off. But what if we kept heating over and over and over again, if we got too hot, in other words, maybe that motor wasn't working, and I was to heat this up too much, this dial would continue to turn until this switch right here broke these two wires. In other words, when this switch went too far, it would actually break the wire here. By doing that, we would de-energize our combination gas valve, which would shut off 
the flame so that we would no longer have heat going in that system. If this did not work and it kept heating, this would melt and it would break it here. So we got two safeties. Either one of those safeties would shut off the combination gas valve to allow the system to not create any more heat. So if I didn't have this fan motor working, this would definitely overheat. So what we're gonna do is let this cool down and you'll see that that fan motor is gonna shut off. But before we do that, what would happen if we were to energize the fan switch while it was running in low speed? So we're gonna connect R to G. So what happened here, I've now energized R to G. We've energized the low voltage side of our fan switch, which has now um, opened this side and then it closed this side. So now we've bypassed this switch altogether and we've sent power from line one straight over to high speed. So now I'm only running one speed at a time. If I disconnect to this speed here, we go back to its normal position of being closed like so. Now this cooled off enough so it shut off on its own, but if we heat it back up, so that fan very quickly came on. What I'm gonna do is heat this up even more so you'll see what happens right here. So if I added heat to it, you see how quickly the dial turned? Here's our mark position and this is our limit position. So right now it broke these two connections. So even if I energize R to W, sending voltage to here, it won't go anywhere. It'll stop right here because this is open. Now also in our electrical schematic, I've included this. This is their separate wiring schematic for, and it's not on the actual schematic here, the separate wiring for the pilot valve. So this is a thermocouple uh, made of dissimilar metals. When heated, this thermocouple creates voltage and that voltage goes to its electromagnet for current and this is what's gonna hold it open. So when you press this pilot button, it actually manually lock, locks this in. We're gonna tighten it up. And what I'm gonna do is heat this up with a torch here. Now when I let go of this switch, it still holds it in. So as long as this is hot enough that dissimilar metals is gonna create currents and voltage, that's going to keep this switch pulled in. Once this cools off enough, it's gonna stop creating that voltage and this switch is going to de-energize. So now it de-energized and that shut it off. So that's why the safety on here is gonna shut everything off. Once this switch closes, it will not let gas flow through that system even if I have a call for heat on my solenoid valve here. Very simple system. We have our normally open, closes on temperature rise thermal switch, that's this side. This side is low voltage, which we'll have our switch like so, symbol for temperature, something like this. And then we also have our fusible link. I'll draw that back in, something like this. There's tons of different ways they draw these, but the switch is on the top side, so it's going to open on temperature rise. When the temperature symbol pushes up, it opens it. When this temperature symbol pushes up, it closes it. Now that's how this one's wired. There are some units that use this side that breaks the high voltage power to the, entire, to the entire system. So sometimes you'll see them wired with this switch being wired through here to where it shuts off everything. But that's a whole nother subject. It's just giving you an idea of how these older style fan limit switches worked and how simple the wiring was, lack of safety controls, but a basic wiring schematic follows with the system. If I was to install my thermostat, it would install here. My thermostat wires would connect right here to these components. Very simple system. This is our fan relay. And it's stuck in there pretty good because it melted. Our low voltage side. So when it says fan relay, this is where a low voltage wire is hooked to. On the high voltage side, uh, it's going to be drawn a little different. This is the wire that comes in here. Normally open is here to our high voltage side, to our uh, sorry high speed of the fan. This one is normally closed, which connects it line one to this side to low speed. So it's normally like this. When I energize this connection, it disconnects and then connects like so. Disconnected, connected. So it's either connecting it here or here. Very simple, simple process. Not much to them but uh, that's how it works. Next, we're gonna do is take this heat exchanger apart so you guys can see what it looks like.
now we finally got our heat exchanger out of the system. So people will com commonly ask, well, can't you just replace the heat exchanger? Well, yes and no. Assuming we can still get the heat exchanger, for example, this one we could not, you pretty much have to take everything off of the system except for the blower motor. All of this had to come off. Now, we're still not done because I have to take this top plate off too before I really separate it from this heat exchanger. And we'll do that here in just a few minutes, but you can see replacing the heat exchanger is not just a simple thing to do. But this is our heat exchanger. I'm gonna go ahead and separate this last little plate and then we'll talk about some of the little differences in this heat exchanger. Now we've got these heat exchangers completely out. Uh, in the old, old days, if we wanted to replace one of these, we'd have to do all of that steps just to get to this one component right here and put a new one in. So you can see it's pretty simple. Our burners would be here. The flames would stop about here. The hot gases would transfer through this material to the top. We have this little extra component here, which is a type of draft diverter. This helps uh, the draft from pulling too far and keep it equal across the heat exchanger. If you notice, there's a lot of soot buildup on this component, uh, especially this is the side that had the pilot light burning. But inside of here, we also see all these water stains. So the evaporator coil is probably leaking at one time, dripping onto this, causing damage. This one's actually really nice. This is a nice light model. Even though it's a 1980 model, it's still a really nice light one compared to the older versions the, to this. I remember pulling some of these heat exchangers out that were completely cast iron and those were extremely heavy, extremely backbreaking. Ask one of the older guys in the field about removing those cast iron heat exchangers and they will tell you. So a pretty simple process. Um, now talking about these heat exchangers, you wanna look for cracks in these and cracks can be anywhere any one of these bins are, burns out in the side, any one of these bins here. There was an old school method that we used to use that we would actually, or some people would use, they would take a spray uh, bucket and they would spray water on this. And what they would do is they'd put a mirror inside or some kind of a scope inside and inside of here and they would look for the water coming through to the inside. You could have a crack that was so small you couldn't see it, but the water would pick up on the other side. I never liked that and a lot of the manufacturers did not either because you're talking about putting water on something that rusts and that water would speed up the rusting process. So I wasn't a big fan of that. But if I had one that I was sure was leaking and I wanted to confirm it, it was already going to be replaced anyways, that would be a step you could do to fully confirm was it a hairline crack that just looked like it or was it actually a crack. But that's the heat exchanger. This is all that's left of the system. Uh, once you pull these heat exchangers out, nothing really left in there. This guy's going to go to the junk pile. I've been dragging this old furnace around the country for uh, many years now. Uh, so now it's all in video. I can take this to the scrap pile and be rid of it. Have a great day.